Good evening. Hang on, get the camera all set up here. Turn off the lights so we're not blaring light everywhere. Hopefully that's a little better. Okay, good evening. We got one person waiting already. Sorry, let me adjust the camera. Thought I was prepared tonight. Apparently I'm not quite that prepared. So anyway, let's get started with this. Before we get going here, let me just say that uh, this is a weekly live broadcast. Generally every Thursday evening about 7 o'clock Central, I'm here. Uh, usually about an hour, 7 to 8 Central Time. And uh, you guys can join. You can ask me anything you want to ask me. The only thing I ask is keep it family friendly. Uh, don't start cussing at people. Uh, don't start calling people names, bullying anybody. Don't spam us over and over again with your comment. This is, I don't have a topic planned out. All I do is just follow the chat and try to do my best to respond to all the chats. Sometimes I miss one. So if you do see me, you know, miss your comment and uh, I've, I've answered somebody else's that came after yours, you can go ahead and ask it again. But give me time to get to your comment. Don't just ask the same question over and over and over and over again. We'll, we'll end up booting you guys out if you can't start doing those things. Anyway, all right. So Faith Kaplan is here, says... Uh, come on, Chris. You were waiting on me a little while. Thanks for waiting around. I appreciate that. Hello to you, Boris and Matthew. Matthew says, uh, Jesus is Lord. I agree. Jesus is Lord. And uh, hello to you, Jaden. And uh, says, Jaden Gray says, don't talk Jesus. Well, I'm going to. I'm sorry. I, I am a Christian. If that offends you, I apologize for that. But don't worry. This isn't going to be all about religion. That's just my stance. I don't mind if somebody wants to... Uh, you know, say their praises to uh, Jesus while they're in here, but don't just go crazy with it either. We don't need to, we, you know, we're here for other reasons too. So, all right. Hello to you, uh, Emily. Uh, Jupiter says, hello, Chris. How's your day been going? Oh, it's been busy. Been incredibly busy here lately, but not bad. I was able to get time out to uh, come and spend a, a little bit of time with you guys on the live broadcast. So could be a lot worse. That's for sure. Uh, Sam from Maine says, hello, waiting for some hatching eggs. Any tips you got before I incubate? Well, I've got a whole series on hatching eggs, so you can go back and watch that series. It walks you through the entire process. Um, biggest thing, get your incubator set up ahead of time. If you have the ability to, go ahead and calibrate it. Uh, that would be, um, you know, get a couple of, ink, of uh, thermometers. I always say get two. Um, Non-digital, so get something with either a dial or, a, you know, like a mercury gauge and throw those in your incubator check. Make sure they're calibrated and accurate before you do it. Throw them in your incubator and check to make sure that it's reading the right temperature. That would be the biggest suggestion that I have for you. Um, other than that, though, good luck with your hatch. Hopefully it goes well. And let's see, Helen's here from uh, Queensland, Australia. Hello to you. Bubba Hauk from North Carolina. Uh, Ken Jay from, oh, it just says, hey, Ken Jay here. So hello to you, Ken Jay. Uh, Lauren says, uh, hey, from Henderson, North Carolina. There's another somebody else from North Carolina. Uh, Candido says, uh, newbie here. Hello. Hello to you. Thanks for joining us. All right. Um, J bid says, what are your fourth plans? God bless. Well, like I said, you guys can ask me anything. That's a little random, but let's go ahead and talk about it. I don't have big plans for the 4th of July. Uh, my sister's having a barbecue that evening. Uh, her husband's birthday and her son's birthday. Um, my nephew's birthday all fall real close together, so they celebrate them on the 4th of July. So I'll probably go over there for the evening. Not sure just yet exactly, but that's the, the plan right now. Maybe try to get some fishing in over the weekend, and of course, shoot a couple of videos to get those together for you guys. If I can find some time, I'm going to start responding to some comments again, because I've been lacking responding to the comments on the, um, on the videos lately. I've been reading them, I just haven't had a chance to respond to them, because... I've explained this before, but just in case you haven't heard it, work has been incredibly busy lately. Um, I've got reports that are due by like 6 a.m. in the morning. So I get up about 4.30 in the morning, I start on my reporting, and I get that all knocked out. That's usually the time that I was spending answering comments. So I'm busy that time doing work stuff, and then I'm not getting home from work until about 5.30 or so at night a lot of the times, and I'm just kind of worn out, and my, my schedule's a little bit thrown off. I'll get back on track eventually, hang in there with me. Hopefully, I'll get to uh, answer some questions or some comments pretty soon. All right. Um, where are we at here? Never in Creative says, hey, been watching your videos now for a while, beginning your quail journey or beginning our quail journey. Thanks for what you do. Just got our first eggs yesterday. So tiny compared to our duck eggs. Yep, the quail eggs are tiny for sure, especially compared to uh, duck eggs. So hello to you, Spencer. And uh, let's see, who's this? Uh, Rita says, amen, Chris, probably to my comment about praising God. So thank you for that. Well, amen. Agreed. <laughs> and uh, let's see. Zachab, I think it is, says, hey, Chris, sorry, I don't make it to all the live streams, but thanks for all the videos on the quail. 
helps me out a lot. Couldn't do without you. Well, thank you so much. And don't worry, if you can't make them to all, it's fine. I don't expect you guys to make them to all. I don't expect you to drop what you're doing just to come to a live stream broadcast. I do this to have a chance to interact with you guys, and uh, I'm just glad when you can make it. All right. Um, where are we at here? Never in. How long can a quail, whoops, how long can a quail egg store on the counter? Okay, depends on what you're talking about. Are we talking about for eating or for incubating? Either way, I'll answer both of those questions. Uh, again, it depends on several factors either way. Um, one is probably humidity is one of the big ones and temperature is the other one. So if your temperature is too high and you're talking about fertile eggs, um, they're going to start to develop. And that's if the temperature is over about 75 to 80 degrees, they're going to start to develop and you know it's not going to be good to save them for either one, eating or incubating um, at, that, at that rate. Um, the humidity is the other thing. If you live in a very dry climate, they'll start to lose a lot of the moisture inside the egg pretty quickly. You might get a couple of days, maybe a week out of them before they start going bad. Um, they wouldn't necessarily rot at that point, but they would you know, not be as fresh. They're going to lose a lot of moisture and they're not going to be good for saving for incubating or eating either way that way. Now, assuming you've got the right um, temperature, you know, below about 70 degrees, <coughs> excuse me, let me grab a drink here. I'm kind of dry today. Okay, assuming you got the right temperature, something below about 70 degrees, you know, 50 to 70 degrees, somewhere right around there, Fahrenheit, uh, you should be able to store them for quite a while on the counter if you plan on eating them, you know, weeks on end probably. Um, if you plan on incubating them, really only about seven to 10 days at the most before you want to get them in the incubator and start the incubation process. After about seven to 10 days, uh, the fertility really starts to drop off or the viability of the egg to hatch at that point really starts to drop off. So you're really better off if you want to store them for eating, put, probably put them in your refrigerator, especially if they're fertile eggs, just to keep them from developing. If you want to store them for incubating, um, you know, I always use just a cooler. Um, I've got a small cooler. I put them in an egg carton with one of those freezer packs. Uh, not Don't put that in the egg carton. Put that in the cooler. One of those packs you stick in the freezer and freeze, and then you put in your cooler to keep things cold. Just one of those um, so it doesn't get too cold in there, but it stays cool. And I just switch that out every day. And uh, you can keep them for, like I said, about seven days in there before you have to incubate them. Hopefully that answers your question. All right, Jupiter says, uh, is your... Is your work always this busy this time of year or is it related to the pandemic? It's probably a little bit of both. It's not always this busy this time of year. It fluctuates depending on what's going on. Um, you know, sometimes my role at work changes a little bit, so that makes difference too. But no, a lot of this is related to the pandemic. I work for a call center. I'm an account manager for a call center. And uh, we've taken on a lot of inbound work, uh, which is instead of making outbound calls to call customers to sell television and phone service and internet service and those things, uh, we are taking a lot of inbound calls because some of the places that typically take those inbound calls are short-staffed due to the pandemic, people self-quarantining, those kinds of things. So that's a big reason why it's it's gotten so much busier. If you know anything about call center work, inbound work is a lot. It's a lot more work uh, than than outbound work, making calls, um, because it, it's you just have to you have to make sure you answer the calls when they come in. There is no just take a break whenever you want to. And I'm not on the phone. I'm I'm an account manager, but still it's. It's more work for me, too. So anyway, uh, Matt Sanders says, uh, hello, Missouri native here. Just found your channel recently and enjoy your quail vid videos. Um, I recently got back into quails after years without them. Awesome. It's good to always uh, see another show me stater here. I don't know what part of the state you're from, but um, we'll call each other neighbors anyway. Uh, Spike says, um, have you ever had a power outage when the incubator was in service and still had some hatch or just throughout the whole batch? I have had a power outage. It didn't last for more than a couple of hours. Um, maybe three or four hours, and I still got a decent hatch out of that. So don't stress about that. If you have a power outage, um, if you know it's going to be an extended power outage, um, a couple things you can do there. Uh, one, I, I have a battery backup. Um, it's just a, a deep cycle battery that I keep powered up and an inverter uh, that I can hook up to it and um, plug in and run my incubator for several hours, probably five or six hours at least. Um, so that's pretty, that's something pretty easy. Oh, let's see. Matt's up by Columbia. So a little ways from me, but still not, not too terribly far. Um, the other thing you can do, if it's only going to be out of power for a couple of hours, uh, wrap it with a towel, but don't, don't cover the vent holes at the top. It needs fresh air, but wrap it with a towel just to kind of help, um, insulate it a little bit better and keep it from losing a lot of that heat. But if, again, if it's just a couple of hours, it's no big deal. They're going to be fine. I wouldn't worry about it. If it goes on for like you know a day or two, then it might affect it. But at that point, I'd still try. 
because you never know. You're probably still going to get some to hatch at least. All right. Um, oh, one more drink. All right. Eric says, um, hello, Chris. Good to see you. Love from Canada. Awesome. Thank you for uh, joining all the way from Canada. Lars, hello to you, Lars. Good to see you. Thanks for joining. And uh, Matthew says, I'm from Northern Ireland. Awesome. Ireland's a place I'd always like to visit. Canada is too. Um, never been there. Would like to visit. Uh, my family is actually Irish, uh, both sides. So we can trace them back to Ireland, but um, I've never got a chance to actually visit there. So I would like to do that someday. All right, Spike, Hickory, North Carolina. I um, don't think I've ever been. Well, no, I have been to North Carolina once before. All right. Uh, Michael says, uh, hello, Big Mike and the family from Long Island. Hope you're all well. I came across some baby rabbits today while mowing. The kid begged, the kids begged to keep them and made all sorts of promises. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. I did the same thing when I was a kid, you know, found a baby rabbit, begged to keep it. We actually tried to raise some. My grandpa, uh, while he was tilling the garden, hit a rabbit nest one time and we saved, I don't know, it was like three or four of them and, uh, tried to raise them. It didn't go well. It, it very seldom does. Captive or Wild rabbits do not do well in captivity, so you're better off leaving them alone. Um, I know it's tempting, but uh, you're better off just leaving them where they are. All right. Mark says, um, just had a good hatch. When, ta when talking hatch rates, do you count all the eggs placed or just the fertile eggs? Okay, I count all the eggs placed whenever I count my hatch rate. Um, because you don't really know if the eggs are not fertile or not. Just because they didn't develop doesn't mean they weren't fertile eggs. There could have been a number of different reasons why. So I count all the eggs that I place in the incubator instead of just the fertile ones. Um, you know, with that being said, you know, sometimes I run a really low hatch rate, 50%, 60%. And it's, you know, who knows? It could be some fertility issues in there. Um, it could be a lot of different things. But I just count all the eggs that I set. Those are the ones I use to, to consider my hatch rate. All right. Kinjay says, uh, hey, Kinjay from Jamaica. Awesome. Jamaica's a place I think would be kind of cool to visit too. All right, uh, Spike says, thanks to William Safford. I'm not sure what that means. All right, uh, Cajun King says, hey man, glad to hear from you. Uh, you have helped me so much with my rabbit raising adventures. Thanks so much. Awesome, well, thank you for the kind comments. Uh, uh, Rebecca, do my quail need direct sun? I'm getting ready to build a new cage and would like to put a roof of some sort over the cage, similar to your newer cages. Um, no, they don't need direct sun. In fact, it's probably best to not give them direct sun. If you do, make sure you have a place where they can get out of it. Um, they, for the most part, they're not going to hang out in direct sun. Um, you know, my hutches do get some direct sun, but it's like late, late evening sun. Just before the sun's going down, you know, it hits them directly. So, And it's just, I mean, it's an angle at that point. It's not the high sun, high, hot sun. It's but I mean, it, you're probably best to get it in as much shade as you can, especially in the summertime. The wintertime, of course, is not as big of a concern depending on where you live. Around here, it gets pretty cold in the winter, so a little bit of sunshine is you know, going to be a good thing. But still, you don't want them in direct sun where they have no way to get out of it. You need to give them some kind of shade. And I think in the summertime, it's best to keep them in a shaded area where it's shaded all the time. Um, Rita says, hi, Chris. Have you ever used equine bedding pellets for bedding for chicks? No, I have not. I've heard of other people using them. I don't see why they wouldn't work. I think it's probably a great option, but no, I haven't personally used them. All right, Michael says, I raised quail in a small yard. If I threw a baseball off my back steps, it would pass through four other yards. I'm not super handy, and if I can do it, you can too. <laughs> awesome. I think you're talking to uh, Rebecca about getting her quail hutches built and whether they need direct sun or not, but yeah, you can build it. You can raise them in an incredibly small place, and, and really, a, a quail hutch isn't that difficult to build. Um, I, you know, I would not call myself a master woodworker. I mean, I built my quail hutches, I built my rabbit shed, um, I built a chicken tractor. Um, I could put together some things, but you're going to make mistakes when you first do it. Don't worry about it. It happens. That's how you learn. You learn from your mistakes. All right. Um, Jupiter says, "Don't forget to give Chris a thumbs up, everybody." Well, thank you, Jupiter. I appreciate that. Face says, some people say you have to use antibiotics for quail because if a sparrow comes near my cages, it can spread some microbes, might kill all the quails. Is that right? Do you use antibiotics? No, I don't use any antibiotics. I never have. I've never had a big problem with that. I suppose if a sparrow comes by or any other bird for that matter, it could you know, spread some kind of disease to the birds and it could happen. 
Um, but I'm not one that really thinks of, um, I mean, I don't worry about could happens, you know, it's really not that high of a risk. In fact, I don't think, I, I can't think of a time when I've ever seen wild birds at my quail hutches, you know, a hawk one time, but he was there to try to eat them, but that was it. He was only there for a couple of days and then he gave up and he moved on. But other than that, I don't think the birds have paid any attention to them. I never see them around the quail hutches. Uh, never have, really. So I don't think it's a big concern. And even if it did, um, I mean, just the fact that they're around doesn't mean they're going to spread disease. Um, you know, it's a chance, I guess, but it's not. I don't think it's a big risk. I wouldn't worry about it. I wouldn't do any kind of preventative antibiotics with them. If you start having problems, that may be something you have to address. But until then, I wouldn't worry about it. All right. Um, Lisa says, is reptile sand called calcium substrate uh, good for quail. I don't see why it wouldn't be. Let's see, reptile sand, calcium substrate. I don't know. I'm trying to think of what reptile sand is. Um, you know, I don't know that reptile sand is any different much than other um, other sands. It, you know, calcium. Anyway, it should be fine for them. I don't know exactly what's in it. Check the ingredient list. It's obviously calcium based, but that could be um, there could be a number of different things with that. Um, I don't know that it's worth the price. I mean, I just get play sand or construction sand from the local, like, Home Depot Lowe's. Um, it's pretty cheap. I get it from there, and I just dump it right in the sandbox because it works fine. There's no reason to go with anything kind of too crazy. All right. Um, Emilio says, um, I wish I would be confident enough to do a YouTube channel, but I fear I won't have enough content. It's crazy how you can do it for years and still have... A lot to talk about. You know what? That's the hardest part, honestly, is coming up with new content all the time, um, especially after doing it for years, because for years it was just, I was doing instructional videos, mostly just topics about rabbits and quail, which I still do, but I pretty much covered everything. So what else do I talk about? Um, so I am trying to expand the channel a little bit, make it a little bit more entertaining for everybody, try to give you guys a glimpse of my life. My, my wife doesn't really like to be on camera. She doesn't want to be on it. She's been on a few videos, but it's been a while, um, so I don't really push her to do that too much. So it's just me that gets to be on camera for the most part. You get to see her uh, camera work. She gets to be my cameraman sometimes, uh, but uh, she doesn't want to actually be on camera most of the time. So it's just me. It is tricky to kind of come up with new content all the time and things to talk about, um, but I do my best to try to do that for you guys every, every once in a while. And if I see uh, comments that come up quite frequently, I know, hey, that's probably a topic I need to address, so I get it addressed or I try to. Um, so who's that? Is that Lars with, the, yep, Lars with a 200 Danish crown, I think they are, super chat. Thank you so much, Lars. That's very kind of you. He comes in here all the time and always throws that money at me. I'm very, very nice. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, but yeah, you're right, Emily. It's, it's, it's tough um, to kind of come up with new content all the time. But if you want to start a YouTube channel, just do it. Um, don't be afraid. I mean, watch some of my first videos. They're terrible. Absolutely terrible. They're still there. Uh, you can go back and watch them with black screen transitions in between everything, just drawn out, really. I mean, just, <coughs> excuse me, really terrible videos. But unless you ever, unless you start, I mean, if this is, if that's what you want to do, you're never going to be ready to do it. You just kind of have to do it and learn from your mistakes and figure out what's working and what's not working. And, uh, just do it. That's all you can do. That's all I can tell you. Um, Michael says, um, I'm thinking about getting rid of the roosters since I would only hatch out eggs once a year or so to replenish my layers. I'm in a small yard. Uh, my four roosters can be a little loud. Yeah, I understand that, Michael. And you know, you don't have to get rid of all of them necessarily. You might get all but two or three. Now, here's the thing. In the um, in the wintertime, they're going to quiet down anyway. Uh, as soon as the days start to get shorter, below about 12 hours a day, the roosters pretty much stop crowing for the season. Um, and then they'll start back up again in the spring, but they'll stop crowing. So, you know, if you plan on hatching out again, you might want to hang on to at least one or two of them. Uh, you know, keep it with just a handful, you know, four or five birds at least. So you get some fertile eggs out of them, you can incubate those later. Uh, but, yeah, you don't necessarily have to keep them all around either. Um, William says, um, I have swifts and sparrows come to visit my chickens and sometimes quail. Never any issues. Good to know. So, yeah, I don't have any birds really messing with my quail or coming near them, really. All right, Faith says, how to be sure if my quails can handle without the heat lamp? How to be sure? Oh, okay. So what you're saying is you want to know if it's okay to remove the heat lamp from your birds and to move them outside or just remove the heat lamp, one or the other, right? Well, a couple of things I'll tell you about that. First of all, um, 
I don't know what part of the world you live in, if it's summertime there, if it's wintertime there, what your temperatures are like. So I'll talk about my situation in the summertime. You know, like right now, our days are up at like 95 degrees during the day. Um, it's like a 100 degree heat index every day. And the nighttimes usually are in the high to mid 70s, um, sometimes higher than that. But it's about as low as it gets right now this time of year is usually around 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so right now, the birds usually are fully feathered out by about two weeks. Now, they're not great big birds at that point, but they, they've got all their feathers in. And with those kinds of temperatures, it's fine to remove the heat lamp. Now, don't just take them from 100 degrees and just take all the heat away from them. You know, back it off a little bit slower. Um, you probably don't need it during the day if it's getting up to 95 degrees, but try to drop them down to, you know, like 80 degree low and leave them there for a couple of days and then maybe 75 degrees, leave them there for one or two more days and then take the heat lamp away. You don't have to worry about it. Now in the winter time, when the temperatures are much colder, I usually don't have baby quail in the winter time. I have them in the fall though, where the temperatures are much cooler, where the nighttime lows are getting down in the 50s, 50 degree Fahrenheit. Now that's a little bit um, on the chilly side. So um, that time I'm gonna let them grow out a little bit longer, usually do about three weeks, and I'm gonna take them off the heat lamp a little bit slower, so I'll back them down, I'll get them down to 70 degrees, same process. Uh, when they're two weeks old, I'll start backing the heat off, give them, move them from 100 degrees down to you know 85 degrees, and then maybe down to in the 70 degrees. And then I'll leave them there for a couple of days, and then down to the 60 degree, and leave them there for a couple more days, and then down to 50 degrees, leave them there for a couple more days. And then usually by that time, they're about three weeks old, it's okay to take the heat away from them, no problem. Watch your birds. Um, if you go to move the heat lamp away from them a little bit, and they all just huddle underneath it, spend all their time huddle underneath it, they're not quite ready. They need that heat lamp probably a little bit longer. What you should see when you back the heat lamp off is they may initially kind of huddle under it a little bit, but pretty quick within a couple of hours, they'll spread out and they'll start moving around the brooder box and just be completely comfortable. So it's it's that you can kind of tell that way. But again, about two weeks. Hopefully that answers your question. It's not a clear cut, you know, here's how you can tell. But it's really not that complex. You should be fine. Just watch your birds if they're all... You know, at nighttime when it's starting to get cool, if they're all just piled up together in the middle, they probably need a little bit more heat, uh, more heat and at least for a little bit longer. Um, if they're all just kind of spread out all over the place, it's fine. All right, um, Lisa, I have issues trying a reptile incubator. To, oh, I had issues trying a reptile incubator to hatch my quail due to its cooling effects. I did, however, get only three males and 17 females. Well, that doesn't sound too terrible. Three males and 17 females is pretty good. I don't know how many eggs you set, but, you know, I wish I could get three, you know, 17 females and three males out of every hatch. Usually it's the other way around. I'm getting like 15 females and four females. Maybe not quite that bad, but usually at least half roosters every time. All right. Um, Sergio says, hello from St. Louis. Well, hello to you, Sergio. I was in St. Louis yesterday, actually. Uh, my wife had a doctor's appointment up there, so I had to take her to St. Louis. It's a long drive. It was four hours up there, and then three hours for our appointment, and then four hours back. <laughs> so we left the house at 8 o'clock yesterday morning. We got home at 9.30 last night. Made for an early morning this morning, but we made it. All right. Um, DLN says, um, I had male quail in the same pen waiting for them to finish crowing out, or growing out, excuse me. Uh, they just turned eight weeks old and started really picking on each other. I had to butcher a couple hurt so bad. Yeah, that can happen sometimes. Sometimes, you know, any of your quail, usually it's the hens that tend to be more aggressive than the roosters. The roosters will crow, um, but occasionally you'll get birds that are just super aggressive. When they hit sexual maturity, they just go after every other bird. They're just mean as can be. Um, I do a pretty hard call on that. Um, I just call those birds out. I don't want them to be part of my breeding program. I don't want to pass those genes on. And you know, my birds are pretty docile now. They're pretty mellow. I very seldom ever have any problems with them fighting with each other, picking on each other. Sometimes the males are a little bit over anxious to breed. And um, you know, they will, you know, you'll, you'll end up with bald females, a strip of, you know, feathers missing from the back of their head, but that's not aggression, that's different. So um, yeah, I don't blame, I, I understand that. I know, and you're, you, I think you probably did the right thing. Just call them out. Um, Oh, what does this say? Thomas David says, what are some ways of keeping your quail cool in these 90 degree temps? You know, I don't bother with it too much. Uh, I don't do anything special. Uh, they're in a spot where they're shaded, um, not just by the roof of the hutch that they're in, but also trees that hang over the, the top of the hutch. So there's never direct sun hitting the hutch itself. Um, 
that helps a lot. Um, it's also ventilated very, very well, so there's good airflow through there. That helps a lot. Fresh water, make sure they always have access to fresh water. Other than that, I don't do anything special. They do just fine. Um, you know, you could try to add some uh, some uh, fans. Um, I wouldn't put it blowing directly on the birds, but blowing over, you know, through the cages maybe to get some air circulation going in there, get some air moving around. If you live in a dry climate, you can use misters. Don't miss the birds directly, miss the hutch, and then that evaporation will cause it to be much cooler in there as well. Those are a couple of things you can do, but other than that, I, I don't stress about it too much. I mean, these are birds that, I mean, you know, they, <laughs> animals live in the wild, live out in this condition all the time. So, I mean, they're, they're actually pretty well, they can handle it pretty well, unless you've got an old bird or a sick bird or something like that that probably needs to be called out anyway at that point. They're going to be okay in the heat. They're, it's not that big of a deal for the for the uh, quail. It's a little bit of a bigger problem for the rabbits, um, but it's not that much different for them either. I just keep them shaded, make sure they have plenty of water, good ventilation. Those are the biggest things you can do for them. All right. Um, Neverend says, "What are some of your favorite fall crops?" Well, good question. Um, <clears throat> you know, I honestly have a hard time with fall crops around here because it seems like it goes from you know super hot summer. Um, and then we get into fall and it's still pretty hot days up to 80, 90 degrees, which is hard to get anything to grow in. I mean, hard to get anything to germinate. Let's put it that way um, in those kinds of temperatures. And then the nights start dropping down and they start getting colder. And then all of a sudden we're in winter and it's just freezing. But, you know, I like to, I mean, think things like greens and, um, you know, brassicas. Those are the things that are really good for um, cold season or for late season fall. Um, so lettuce and spinach and, uh, you know, if you like the stuff, kale and arugula, I don't care for the, either one of those. Uh, cabbage is a good one to grow there. Brussels sprouts, broccoli, um, cauliflower, all those kinds of things like that do pretty well in, uh, in the fall. Um, and they don't do real well in the heat of summer. So it, that, that's really my favorite things to grow in the fall itself. Um, all right. Um, where are we at here? Hyatt or Wyatt, sorry, says uh, my quail started laying seven days ago and I'm wondering if I can start incubating the eggs or is it too early? Well, check a couple of them and see if they're fertile. Um, just, you know, crack them open, dump them in a bowl, look at the yolk. It should have a little white dot on it. That just means it's a mature egg. Look for a bullseye ring around that white dot. And if you can see a faint kind of dark ring around that, they're fertile eggs. So just check your fertility. Um, you know, to answer your question, seven days is probably not necessarily too early, but you might wait another week. I always give them about two weeks from the time they first start laying before I expect the eggs to be really fertile and have good fertility in the eggs. All right. Uh, chinky, Chinkies. I'm just going to call you Chinky because I can't pronounce it all. Uh, it says, nice shirt. Thank you. One of my favorite shirts. Love it. Um, Rachel says, hi, Chris from Arkansas. Well, depending on what part of Arkansas, you truly are neighbors. We're not very far from the Arkansas border here. All right. Hello to you, Salvador. And uh, Sergio says, have fleas ever been a problem for your quail? No, never had a problem with fleas on my quail or my rabbits for that matter. Um, you know, if I did get fleas, that that would be one thing where I would think I would I would probably advocate the use of pesticides, ivermectin, something like that to get rid of them. Fleas are incredibly hard to get rid of if you get them. Um, but I've never had a problem with fleas. Um, I keep my dog on a, um, his heartworm medication also protects against fleas and ticks and things. And that really helps because you know, dogs usually are the carrier, dogs or cats, um, can be big carriers of fleas, and that's what's going to bring them in. If you can keep them off your dog or cat, I found that, you know, fleas don't typically hang around. So that's that's how it's always worked for me anyway. But no, I've never had that problem. Steve says, um, hi from North Carolina. we got a lot of people in here from North Carolina tonight. Well, thanks for joining. I appreciate it. All right. Owen says, sounds like a rare incident. Okay, a rare incident. I don't know. Sure, what, I'm not sure what we're talking about, but I'm sure it was a conversation that made sense when you posted it, but that was probably a while back, and I'm not sure I lost it. Uh, Dixon's Dairy Goat says, born in Missouri, native, uh, saying hello from Idaho. Awesome. Well, good to see you. Thanks for uh, joining the live broadcast from Idaho. I've always wondered what makes you move from, like, Missouri to Idaho, um, or, you know, vice versa. Whenever people show up here from, like, California or other places, I'm always like, why did you pick Missouri, southwest Missouri, of all places, you know? Always wonder why, but anyway... This is home. I lived in uh, Texas for about seven years, and uh, but I've, I'm from here. Actually, I was born in Michigan, but I was about two years old when my parents moved back here. They're both from this area, and um, this is where I pretty much lived my whole life. All right. Mark says to Thomas David, says, ice cream. I think that's about keeping the quail 
Cool. Yeah, give them ice cream. I, they, I don't know. They might enjoy it. I don't think it's probably, it's probably not good for them. I don't know that I'd give them dairy products. It probably, I mean, they're good chance it'll develop some kind of respiratory problems from that, but who knows? Um, Mark Myers says, Southwest Missouri is beautiful. Yeah, I think so too. It's gorgeous. I mean, we're right at the edge of the Ozarks and the Plains, um, and the Ozarks are definitely incredibly beautiful. Um, just if you've never been there, it's something to see. It's, it's worth checking out. So is Arkansas too. Um, you know, it's not, I mean, I guess Northern Arkansas is part of the Ozarks as well, but they also have the Boston Mountains down there, which are really, really pretty as well. All right, Rachel says, uh, my quail doing good, had five dozen eggs so far, only four females and one one male. Awesome. Glad to hear it, and congratulations. Uh, Jeff says, can you feed game bird feed crumb to baby chickens that just hatched? Um, I, I'm not a chicken expert. I think, I, mean, I don't see why you couldn't feed it to them, but it might be a little bit high protein for chickens. Um, you might want to go with probably a specific, I mean, if you need to feed it to them for a day or two to get you by until you can get more, it's fine. Don't worry about it. But it's probably not the best diet for them on a regular basis. It's probably pretty high protein for them. I think you probably want a little lower protein for chicken and probably would be better off going with a chick starter as opposed to a game bird starter with them. But again, I'm not a chicken expert necessarily. So I'd have to research that a little bit um, to find out. But I don't, I don't think it's the best bet for them for a, for a regular diet. All right, um, Zach says, what can I feed? Uh, what can I feed my quail other than turkey feed I get from my local store? Well, that's probably your best bet if you can't get a game bird starter. Turkey starter is really good. Um, it's a really close comparison to game bird starter. You could go with a chicken starter, like a chick, uh, chicken chick starter for them. It is a little higher protein than regular chicken feed. You may have to bump it up a little bit though. So you can get something like you know, catfish food or cat food, dry cat food or something like that, um, grind it up and mix it in with the feed to kind of up the protein levels a little bit. Um, any of those things would work. But I think turkey starter, if you can't get game bird starter, is probably your best bet. Um, Robin says, uh, we have a New Zealand who is a new mother. Babies are two weeks and the mother has started sneezing. I removed the straw and hair. Is there something I should be giving her? That's scary whenever you get a rabbit that starts sneezing, you worry about snuffles. Um, I would make sure that she is, now of course you can't isolate her from the baby she's got right now, but I would make sure she is isolated from every other rabbit that you have. Get all the other rabbits away from her um, just to be on the safe side because if it is something like snuffles, that can be incredibly contagious. Uh, the babies are only two weeks old, so you just gotta kinda take a chance and hope that it's just you know dust or who knows what. Um, but watch for you know nasal discharge and those kinds of things. Um, you know, if it is something like snuffles, you know, that can be caused by a couple of different things. Assuming it's bacterial, you might start her on a round of antibiotics, but I would give her a couple of days. Make sure that it's a, still going on before you just, you know, treat her. If she started sneezing, you saw her sneeze once or twice, don't worry about it too much. But again, isolation, get her away from the rest of your rabbits. Um, I wouldn't say she has to wear a mask or anything like we do, but get her away from the rest of your rabbits because you don't want that to pass on to the rest of them or get their other rabbits away from her either way, whichever works out well. But you got to leave the babies with her. You can't take them away. Um, <clears throat> something you should give her, uh, you know, like I said, if you notice, especially if you notice any kind of discharge, um, like, you know, like snot from her nose, um, you know, uh, you know, excessive moisture from her mouth, getting on her face, you know, any of those things, eyes, watery, any of those kinds of things, um, then I would go with a round of antibiotics. Check with a local farm supply store. They should be able to, to set you up with some kind of antibiotics that you can use for them. Um, and that would be my best guess on that one. Um, it's you know, sort of taking her to a vet, which is probably prohibitively expensive, unless you're just, you know, incredibly in love with this rabbit, you know, uh, short of taking her to a vet, that's my best suggestion there. You don't really know what the issue is and how to treat it exactly without a vet care. You just got to kind of guess at it and hope you get lucky. Um, but you know, if it's, if it's viral, there's not really much you can do anyway. If it's bacterial, then antibiotics are going to help. So really that's about it. You can try the antibiotics, see if they do it. Hopefully they do. Um, uh, but again, give her, make sure you see some other kind of signs, not just one or two sneezes, um, uh, before you do that. All right, um, Michael says, have you ever heard of people burying fish in their garden? If so, does it matter if it's the whole fish or can you bury what's left after cleaning a fish? I'm new to fishing, so I'm curious about this. Oh yeah, that's a pretty common thing. Um, people burying a fish in their garden under their tomato plants or whatever and you know, say it works. I, you know, I, it's, I mean, 
I, it doesn't matter if you use the whole fish or just what's left over. It's the act of the fish deteriorating and um, you know rotting into the soil. And it's probably more like what it draws in, like the bugs that come and the microbes that come that that, that break that down, uh, that do feed your plants and help them to um, you know gives them fertilizer. Basically, um, it doesn't matter. You can use whatever is left over from the fish, you can do it that way. It'd be fine. All right. Um, Eagle's Wing Sec. Eagle's Wing. We'll just call you Eagle's Wing. Uh, says, great channel. I had about a 50% of a recent uh, group of eggs in the incubator fail to hatch. Fully developed, never pipped, dead in the shell. Very sad. What can I do? Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, okay, this is a common question that we get, and there may or be, I mean, who knows what caused the issue. First things I always say is check to see if your temperature is correct. Make sure your incubator is reading temperature correctly. It's probably the biggest issue with uh, failed hatches is the incubators, you know, it says it's incubating 100, but it's actually only 98 or it's actually 102, you know, something like that. So um, get a couple of non-digital cal uh, cal um, non thermometers. There we go. That's the word I was looking for. Calibrate them. Make sure they're accurate before you do this. Put them in your incubator. Run your incubator for a little while. Um, and just check to see is it you know it says 100 on the thermometer on the incubator what does it say on the thermometers and i always say get two so you're you're sure that it's not you know if you've only got one you're like well which one's right the thermostat or the thermometer if you've got two and any three of those things are reading the same either the thermometers or the incubator then you can pretty much bet that that's the right temperature and uh, just verify that it's reading the right temperature that's the first place to start second um you know did you have too much humidity in your incubator you know, a lot of times we focus so much on having not enough humidity, but really too much can be just as bad. So if you had somewhere like an 85, 90% humidity rate or, or higher, and, and not just based on what the dial says on the, on the humidity gauge on the incubator, but you know, like where your window's overly fogged up and water dripping from them, that's too high in the humidity. Um, you know, light mist on your windows or light fog on your windows is okay, but if there's water con condensing on the, wind on the screen or the plastic windows, and dripping off of it, that's pretty high humidity. They may have drowned in the eggshell. Um, <coughs> conversely, low, low, low humidity, especially when they start pipping. If you open the um, incubator up and that rush of dry air comes in, it can shrink wrap them inside their eggshell. So, I mean, there's a couple things, or it could be bacterial. Could have had some kind of bacterial problem that ended up killing them out. But my best bet is start with the thermometer and the ink and the uh, temperature. That's the easiest thing to verify. Start there and then work your way backwards on it. That's probably my best advice on that one. And don't worry, 50% is not a terrible hatch rate. Sometimes you just have a bad one. Just try. I mean, if your incubator temperature is right, try again. See if it see if you get a better one the next time. Who knows? All right. Spencer says, oh, and one other thing I will say is, um, you know, something I've noticed, like, I've got a window, I'm, I'm looking over here because my incubator's right over here and I've got eggs in the incubator. And I've got a window right there. Um, it's got a shade pulled on it, but my wife had put some plants up in the window and had the window open. And uh, I was in here one afternoon, and I was looking through that, I was looking at that window and I was realizing the sun is coming right through that window and hitting that incubator. So, you know, that could be another issue that, I mean, your incubator may be reading the temperature correctly, but if the sun's going, you know, shining directly on that glass of that incubator, it's going to create a greenhouse effect in there. And even if the heat's turned off, it's still going to heat up and it can cook your eggs or at least some of them, you know, not really cook them, but you know what I mean, overheat them and cause the birds. That's something to think about. I've since closed the shade, so I hopefully don't have that problem. But, um, but it's something you, I mean, I, I don't know that I'd ever figured that out. I just I thought I heard birds chirping in the incubator. I was like, oh no. And then I got to think, well, no, we're like days away. We're like on day like 11 or something. It, there's no way they'd be hatching this early. But anyway, um, where was I going with that? Oh, that's something I wouldn't think about because I'm at work all day long. So when I you know leave for work, the sun's not shining through that window. When I get home from work, the sun's not shining through that window. You know, it's just a short window there in the afternoon, but that can, that can be a problem. All right, um, Fred says, do you ever do fishing videos? I know you said that you would like to get some fishing in this weekend. Yeah, I would like to. I haven't, I have done some fishing videos before. I've done a couple of them. Um, fishing videos are hard to do um, because it's, you know, I'll tell you why. Hang on. Fishing videos are hard to do because the fish don't bite when you have the camera on. That's my experience anyway. <laughs> so it's really hard to get fish to, you know, actually catch a fish when you're on camera. So most of it is just you with the camera and you're just floating around. I, I fish out of a kayak. Um, most of the time, you're just floating around casting and not catching anything. 
because you can't just run the camera nonstop. It's got, you know, a finite amount of battery life. So, uh, you know, every time I turn the camera on, the fish stop biting. That's just my luck. But who knows? Maybe I'll do it. Same thing with hunting videos. I've tried to do a hunting video or two, but, you know, deer never come around when the camera's on. As soon as you turn the camera off and it's where you cannot turn it back on easily, there's the deer. And he's there for just a minute. You don't have time to turn the camera on. And, you know, it's, it's just tricky. All right. Uh, Michael says, thanks for all the advice about the crowing. I didn't realize they would get quieter in the winter. You ever really, oh, uh, you have really helped us be self-sufficient. I know it's easy since you were, I know it's not easy since you work full-time. Thank you. Well, thank you for the kind comments. And yeah, you know, once the daylight starts dropping, now your, your hens are going to stop laying eggs at that time too. But yeah, once the daylight starts dropping down below about 12 hours a day, they pretty much shut down. I mean, the, the crowing and the egg laying is part of their breeding behavior. And you know, the breeding season for them is, you know, once the days get over 12 hours a day to 14 hours a day of sunlight on a regular basis, that's when they breed. So that's when the roosters crow and the, and the hens lay eggs. So, you know, you take that light away, they'll shut down, they'll stop all that. Um, you can actually, you know, if you find a way to like cover up their hutches and make it dark earlier for them, you can get them to quit crowing now, but you're not going to get fertile eggs from them either. So, all right. Um, oh, no, Pasha says, uh, good evening. I'm just asking why my rabbits eat their young ones. Oh, that's terrible. Um, you know, it's, it's rare that you actually have a rabbit that does that. It is probably some kind of survival instinct. They don't feel comfortable for some reason whatsoever, whatever that is. Um, and it's a way for them to uh, deter predators, to, um, you know, make sure that their, 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 uh, you know, their litter doesn't go to waste, basically. Um, you know, there are a couple of tricks if you've got a rabbit that is prone to doing that. Um, people say put a put a raw piece of bacon in there whenever they first have their babies and they'll eat that and then they'll be, they won't want to eat the babies because they'll have that, you know, it could be some kind of messed up thing in their brain or some kind of dietary thing, you know, that causes that. That might work. My personal opinion is if you have a rabbit that eats your babies on a regular basis, I'm not talking about just one time, but does it maybe one or two litters in a row, get rid of her, get a new rabbit, because that's really, really bad mothering instincts. And it's very, very rare for them to do that. So I personally think it's just a bad genetic trait. They're not cut out to be a mother. I'd, I'd get a new rabbit. That would be my best advice. All right. Um, Andrew says, uh, you can tell the eggs are female uh, by being more round at the tip while the males are pointy at the top. Well, that's not really true, Andrew. I mean, you may have got lucky and got it right that one time, but that's that's an old wives' tale. It's a common myth, but no, it's not really true. Um, it, but you know, anyway, you can test it out and see. But no, I don't. It's not really a true thing. But anyway, um, Neverink says, "What made you start to raise your own meat eggs? Do you have any long-term goals for a homestead or a farm?" Well, <coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> Into the drink here. I talk too much, don't I? just nonstop catches up to me sometimes. All right. So what made me start wanting to raise my own meat and eggs? And do you ever have any long-term goals for a homestead or a farm? Okay. I don't know if I have any, I don't have any solid plans for a, you know, true homestead or a farm. I wouldn't mind doing something like that, but you know, a homestead, you know, people, I think, um, you know, any of you guys that homestead on a regular basis or your farm, you actually do that for, you know, that's what you do for your living. Um, you know what I'm about to say is true. People talk about, and there is freedom in homesteading and farming, but people talk about it like, I mean, like some dream, like, you know, I want to, I want to live off the land. I want to be my own person. I want the freedom, but you, you, you'll never work so hard in your life as you will if you farm or homestead on a regular basis. And you talk about like leaving for a weekend or something. There's none of that when you're on a, when you own a homestead or when you own a farm, you're not, you're not leaving. You know, you've got to be there all the time and it's work. It's constant hard work. Now I'm not afraid of that. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but I'm just saying that, you know, I, I don't know that at this point in my life, I'm ready to devote my, you know, devote all that time to it right now. I've got it pretty easy. Um, I've got a full-time job that pays the bills um, so that's nice. Um, I, I raise I raise meat because I enjoy raising my own food, and I can produce a pretty significant amount of it with not a whole lot of work. But I can't produce all of it and all the money I need to live, you know, without going full time into it and working nonstop and not having any time off. But right now I'm set up where you know, I can take a vacation if I want to, and I can just have the neighbor come over. It's 10, 15 minutes every day to feed all the animals and take care, and and done. So it's not that big of a deal for me. Um, 
But if you go bigger, it's a little different. Anyway, so that's, I don't know, maybe I'll do that at some point. Maybe I won't. I don't know. Um, what made me want to start to raise my own meat and eggs? Well, I've always had, I've always raised animals, um, you know, dogs and cats and reptiles and amphibians, um, you know, ferrets, um, I mean, all kinds of things I've raised. I mean, it's just something that I've always done. It's just always been a part of my life. I grew up in a country family for the most part. So, you know, we just, it was just normal stuff, you know. Um, but to raise my own meat, you know, my, my family did raise, my grandmother anyway, raised uh, chickens and things like that for their own uh, food. So it was, you know, normal life to me. It wasn't that that odd. Um, I decided to start raising my own because it was like, you know, I, I live in town. So I always kind of thought, well, I'd like to get a place out in the country so I can do that. And I got thinking, why can't I just do it right here? So I just started doing it. I mean, it's just... I don't, I don't know. I don't know if there was one, like one thing that made me start to want raising. I've always gardened. I've always, it's just always been a part of life, but I don't know if that was a great answer to your question, but hopefully I got an answer. Fred says, uh, my chicken's coop gets muddy at times. What bedding would you suggest to keep it dry as possible? You know, that's a good question. I don't know what the best solution for that is. That's one of the reasons why, yeah, I can imagine it gets terribly muddy. Um, they, I mean, they eat the grass and just destroy it. So, you know, give them a bigger area to roam, move them around a lot. I, you know, there's a couple of suggestions for that. Um, somebody mentioned equine bedding, um, you know, equine like horse pellets, uh, the, the, the pellets they use for horse bedding and stuff like that. I think those are a pretty good solution for that, but I don't know that I'm the best one to answer that question because I don't really have that problem. So, um, you know, I move my chickens in a tractor. Of course, they're temporary. They're not permanent chickens. They're only here for another couple of weeks. But um, I move them around um, so that I don't have to worry about muddy areas, you know, too much and don't have to worry about keeping it dry. Um, sorry, man, I don't have a great suggestion for you. That's my best thought right off the top of my head. Um, Charlie says, hi, Chris, I have nine two-day-old quail. One is all black and has black legs. Is that normal? Uh, thanks for all your videos. Well, I wouldn't say that's incredibly normal, but it's not that abnormal. Um, you know, even if you have like purebred quail, like they're like meat makers, Bo Faro or something like that, you know, those are all bred down from other birds. I mean, they're all, they still have some of those recessive genes in them. If you get just the right mix, you might get a weird, odd quail every once in a while. What you're describing sounds kind of like what they call a Manchurian quail, uh, the color pattern anyway. Um, so it's probably just a recessive gene that, you know, a couple of your birds have, and it just happened to fit right and created that one. So I wouldn't worry about it. It's not... It's not really normal, but it's not that abnormal either. All right, Grinnan says, hello from North Carolina, or hello again from North Carolina. Have you ever experimented with different feeds to finish a bird before calling? No, uh, not really. Um, no, no, I just feed game bird starter. The, <clears throat> the thought of finishing a bird, I think, makes sense. Um, if we're talking about finishing them on, like, you know, pasture and, uh, you know, grass and grains and uh, bugs and all those kinds of things, but just switching from one commercial feed to another. I don't know that it would make that big of a difference. Maybe I'm wrong. It might. I don't know. All right. Mama Tried Homestead says, uh, hey, y'all. <laughs> Hello to you. And uh, James he says, hey, from Victoria, Texas. Hello. Thanks for joining. Uh, Gingerbeard says, good evening, Chris. Four does due within the next week to week and a half. Also just watched my six-year-old get, six get ninja kicked by a hen when he tried to catch one of her chicks. You're talking about an actual chicken, maybe? I don't know. Yeah, they can do that. That's You're laughing, too. So hopefully he's okay. Uh, that's funny. But, um, <laughs> yeah, uh, that is hilarious. Um, Gary Gray says, hi, from Central Arkansas. Hello to you, Gary. Um, Mama Tried says, uh, fleas are terrible here in southwest Georgia. Well, you know, they can be bad here, too. But luckily, I've been able to keep them, so far, keeping the dog on his you know, medication that keeps the fleas and stuff off him hasn't, I haven't had problems with him. All right, Rebecca says, my daughter has a broody bantam and is trying to hatch quail eggs with her. Is there any chance of success? Yeah, there is. Absolutely. The people that do that um, quite frequently, I'm, what kind of hatch rates you're going to get, hard to say, but try it and see if it works. Um, but yeah, there's plenty of people that have done that before with a, banty, uh, with a broody bantam hen. All right, um... Jim Bowie says, my Bob White quail laid 18 eggs so far and appear to be sitting on them. I'm too busy to hatch, so I'm going to let them hatch them. Hopefully it works. Good luck with that. I hope it does too. Um, Bob White are probably a little bit more likely to hatch their own eggs than Caternics are, but um, you know, I hope you get a good hatch rate out of it. Oh, who was that I missed? I scrolled too much. 
MZ says hi from uh, Birmingham, UK. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Mark says, oh, we already talked about that one. Uh, Verna says, hi, Chris. Um, am late, but I'm made. Well, thanks for making it, Verna. It's okay. We're not keeping track of your time. We, <laughs> we won't mark you tardy. Uh, Fred says, um, I'm from Warm Springs, Georgia. Fleas are terrible here. Well, I can I can imagine they are. They're, they're bad here, too, if you don't, like I said, if it, when I was a kid, we didn't have, um, you know, a lot of the flea treatments that are available now. A lot of the things, preventative stuff for fleas and um, for dogs. And, yeah, if, uh, we've had a couple of times where our dogs got fleas, and my gosh, it's bad. When, you, when your dog gets fleas, it's incredibly hard to get rid of them. Uh, they are bad, <laughs> really bad. I, I understand. Uh, Mama Tried says, my quails have been enjoying a lot of melons and pumpkins the pickles the pickles worms bored into the pickles worms pickles worms huh i'm not sure what pickles worms are but okay um yeah anyway so you got uh damaged fruit or damaged vegetables i guess they're fruits aren't they melons and pumpkins and uh you're feeding those to your quail i think that's a great option for them so we, we've got you know the meat chickens right now so they're getting a lot of those scraps and stuff they really enjoy them um gingerbread said hey chris I have comeback 15% maintenance feed. Is that okay with grow outs and breeders? I also give oats as well. Should I switch or is it okay? 15% feed, in my opinion, is a little bit low on the percent of uh, protein. I, it's not necessarily bad for them. They're going to do just fine on it probably, but I like to have closer to 25%. So I would do something to boost the protein level of the feed or get a higher protein feed if you can. A high protein game bird starter or turkey starter, 25% or more. I feel that they do better on a higher protein feed, but again, they're gonna be okay on 15%. They're not gonna die. They just may be slightly better on a higher protein feed, but you know, use what you can get. Um, <clears throat> Ray says, what treats can I feed my baby quail one week old? Well, I don't know that there's a whole lot of treats you wanna feed your baby quail. Um, you can try feeding them some, you know, pieces of vegetables or stuff, you know, cucumber or something like that. Uh, don't give them iceberg lettuce. Stay away from that. Um, the, the thing about baby quail is you probably don't want to start them on like mealworms because mealworms look a whole lot like quail toes, baby quail toes specifically. And, you know, it doesn't take much. The, the babies haven't figured this out yet. In fact, if you watch baby quail in a brooder, they will often go after the other one's feet because they think it's a worm. So you don't necessarily want to encourage that behavior until they get a little bit older and figure that out. Um, I guess you, I don't know, there may be some other small bugs that you could feed them, but it's probably not a good idea because they really need grit if they're going to be eating live insects and things like that. So I would just keep them on the, on the game bird starter for a while until they, you know, get a little bit bigger and get to the grow out pins. All right. Rachel says, uh, Hatfield, Arkansas. I guess that's where you're from. I'm not sure where Hatfield is, but it's Arkansas. So <laughs> welcome. Ray says, uh, what treats can I feed my, oh, I already read that one, didn't I? One week old. Um, Dixon says, here's that answer. Um, the man that asked me to marry him said I could have my dairy goats and we would, and he would build me a big greenhouse if I would join him in Idaho. Okay, okay, that's the reason you moved from Missouri to Idaho. Okay, well, makes sense, I guess. <laughs> I was lost there for a minute. I wasn't sure what we were talking about, but now I, I caught on, I figured it out. All right. Daniel's Outdoor Adventure says, hey, I bought some young quail. Uh, when do I have to wait till they're fertile? Well, wait till they start laying eggs. Give them about two weeks and probably consider the eggs to be fertile at that point. So how are we doing on time here? About five more minutes left. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Another drink here. All right. Fred says, um, I saw a guy mix catfish 30% and 20% earlier today with chick starter. Yeah, that's probably a good option. Ch catfish food is cheap. It's high in protein. Uh, you can mix it in with your game bird star or with your chick feed now, and uh, it, it'll boost the protein levels of it. So, you know, if you're using a 15% game bird starter and you want to, you know, you can buy some catfish food, grind it up, and mix it in with your um, feed and, and boost the protein levels of it. All right. All right. Daniel's Outdoor Adventure says you can feed them game bird chow. Yeah, you can feed them game bird chow. Um, Daryl from Kentucky, good evening. James says, um, if you have a bigger pin and you're running five hens to a roo uh, ratio, can you put 10 hens and two roos together and be this and be fine in the same? Yeah, I, I do that all the time. Um, if you have a bigger pin and you run, okay, 
let me let me yes you can do that yeah i i don't keep you know just small groups one rooster five hens i keep you know 10 or 12 hens two or three roosters um that, that's how i keep my birds all the time now if you've got two separate uh, groups you've got five hens and one rooster five hens and one rooster i think that's what you were saying and you want to combine those two groups together you can do that but you're probably going to get some fighting when you try to uh, combine adult birds and their strangers they're going to fight it out and kind of establish the pecking order depending on how aggressive your birds are you may get some pretty serious injuries from that you know if you can do that in the winter time when it's you know when they're not as riled up from hormones and stuff it's going to be a little bit easier for you to get them to combine like that or if you can just you know start them out that way grow them up that way together they're going to be fine as well um and the, you know that's you may not have that many issues with it it's something to try but yes you can definitely keep them together in bigger groups um one male for every four to five hens and keep as big a groups as you want one male to every four to five hens um frank says hello from upstairs I don't know what that means. Johnny said, oh, there you clarified. Hello from downstate New York. <laughs> Thanks for joining me. I appreciate it. Jim Bowie says, uh, fish heads or any fish parts are great for tomato plants. Yep, they are. Tina says, uh, can you use a heating plate to four quails in a brooder instead of a heat lamp? Just got some quail and want to hatch soon. Yeah, you can absolutely use a heating plate. I haven't actually done it myself. I use heat lamps, but I plenty of viewers have talked about using heating plates. There's no reason they wouldn't work. They're a great solution. If you've got one, you can use it. Uh, Ginger, Bead says, Ginger Beard, there we go, says, I have four quail in a cage, three hens, one rooster. He seems to be pretty rough with the ladies. Should I place him with a fresh eight-week-old rooster? Should I replace him? I don't think, um, you know, if you're wanting them to be more gentle with them, it's probably not a good idea to replace them with a young rooster. When they first come of age, talk about, you know, rough with the hens. They are they are excited you know, when they first come of age. So as they get older, they tend to calm down just a little bit. But that's, you know, breeding behavior is kind of rough. I mean, it, it looks worse than it is. Um, I don't I don't know that there's much you can do. I, I wouldn't worry about it if I were you. Unless he's like, you know, unless you got birds that are, you know, got holes in the sides of their heads and are bleeding and all those kinds of things, I wouldn't worry about it. Owen says, um, hi, how you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. Dwayne says, uh, did you have any roosters in your meat bird mix? If so, did they crow before you processed? Well, I haven't processed yet, but yeah, I do have some roosters in there. Probably half roosters. They haven't started crowing yet. Um, they don't make very much noise at all. Sorry, I got to adjust my belt buckle. Ah, it's weird and awkward to do on camera, but it's digging into my belly. I need to lose some weight, I guess. Um, no, the, uh, where was I going with that? The roosters don't, they haven't started crowing yet. No, we've only processed five or six birds, five birds so far. Uh, the rest of them I'm letting grow out a little bit longer. Um, but the ones we did process were roosters. Uh, but no, they haven't started crowing yet. Uh, Sergio says, can you keep the hens laying eggs throughout the winter if you use artificial light or have quail indoors? Yeah, you can. Absolutely. If you use artificial light, keep the daylight or keep the light 14 hours a day, you're, you're going to keep them laying much longer anyway. Mine typically, even with the artificial lights, usually around the end of, uh, end of December to about mid-January, they'll quit laying anyway. The days are just too short at that point. It's just really tough. But I figure they need that break anyway. After that, they usually pick right back up, though, so it's not a big deal. All right. Stacy says, uh, hello from Illinois. Thank you for all your help and advice. Well, thank you for watching the videos. I appreciate it. Um, Verna says, uh, Sergio, that's what I do. Make sure there's 12 hours a day of light. Um, where you had Rose Coldrake says, uh, hi, what are you doing to keep your rabbits safe from the rabbit virus that's killing so many rabbits in the U.S.? I don't know that it's that big of a problem, honestly. I mean, maybe it is in certain parts, but, you know, I heard a news story about it that it was found somewhere, but I haven't heard any more issues about it, like, spreading or becoming crazy. I don't know that it's that big of an issue. I'm not doing anything. Um, I'm just hoping it doesn't get too bad and doesn't get here, but who knows? Maybe it will someday. Maybe it'll be a big problem. We'll have to look for some other kind of small livestock to raise in the backyard. Maybe we'll go to guinea pigs at that time. I don't know. <laughs> but, um, but so far, I'm not, I mean, there, I don't know if there's anything you can do about it. Um, just pray and hope that it doesn't get too bad, I guess. Braille Fishing says, uh, my quail, my quail aid their first eggs yesterday. How long does it take till their eggs start getting fertilized? A common question tonight. 
Um, usually about two weeks is what I, I assume. Um, you can just check the fertility in them though and make sure. Uh, you know, crack the egg open, dump it out in a, I'm gonna say crack it open. Hopefully you got a pair of quail eggs so you can snip the top of the egg off, and dump it out. Dump it into a bowl, look at the yolk. There should be a white dot on the yolk. That just means it's a mature egg. Look for a faint dark ring around it, a bullseye ring around that white dot in the, in the yolk of the egg. That indicates that it's a fertile egg. So check, you know, five or 10 eggs and whenever you start getting a 75 or 80 percent, you know, fertility rate out of them, or that you can tell for sure are fertile, I should say, then they're probably good to go ahead and incubate at that point. Usually, it's about two weeks after they start laying. Um, Stacy says, um, "I've had does eat a kit that was already dead. It keeps the nest clean." Yep, that's a good point too, Stacy. You're you're right. If the kit has already died, a lot of times they will do that. They'll just clean up um, the the dead kit and. Uh, to, to keep the, the nest box clean. That's different than eating the entire litter. You know, that's a different thing. All right, Fred says, I watch stoves and I watch stoves and living traditions. They have lots, they have a lots of work every day. Chores never end. Yep, absolutely. I, I'm not familiar with stoves, but I watch living traditions as well. They're a great channel, the great people. If you don't watch their videos, you should go check them out. They're they're much more entertaining than I am, and uh, they do they are true homesteaders. That's what they do. I mean, nonstop. That's their life. All right, Andrew says, "Thanks for the info. I watched a video explaining the egg top. I still give it a try. Go for it, man. No problems." Uh, Fred says, "Stives. I don't. Okay, I still don't know what that is, but I may have to check that out." <coughs> Excuse me. Oh my goodness. No, I don't have Corona. Don't worry. It's just, we had a big storm move through. It's been incredibly humid today. And for some reason, I'm still just dried out. Um, where are we at here? You need to get a cola company to sponsor you. I should, shouldn't I? Have Pepsi sponsor me? They don't, but I should have them. <laughs> I drink enough of the stuff. Yeah, I know it's bad for me. I know. All right, um... Robin's Nest says, tonight will be my first time eating quail eggs, steak and egg for dinner tonight. Robin in Florida. Awesome. Well, good luck with that. I hope that, uh, hope it goes well. Don't be um, surprised when they taste like eggs. <laughs> I think a lot of people are like, ooh, it's quail eggs. It's exotic. It's No, they taste just like eggs. I mean, they're just eggs. They taste like eggs. <laughs> you know, it is hard. If you like fried eggs and you like them fried um, like uh, with a runny yolk, which I really do, um, you're, you're going to, they, they cook incredibly fast. So it's like you crack the eggs. And what I usually do is I cook like four or five, five of them as one. I don't cook each individual egg, fried egg. I just pour, I crack five of them in a bowl, dump the whole bowl in the skillet and cook all of them at one time. Um, so wait till they get, you know, just about done on the bottom, flip them over, let them set for 30 seconds or so, maybe a minute. And then off the, off the stove, because otherwise they will be cooked all the way through. There's not, I mean, they're not very big, so it's hard to get that yolk just right. Um, where are we at here? Rose Coldrick says rabbit virus is RHDV2. Yeah, I know. Um, yeah, I'm familiar with it. The same one that they struggle with in Australia, right? I think. Anyway, hopefully it doesn't become that bad here. Hopefully we don't have too many issues. Australia, I think, actually introduced it to try to control the rabbit population there because rabbits are a problem in Australia, but not, it's different. All right. Melanie, hi from Alabama. Hello to you. Thanks for joining. We're just... Oh my gosh, we're over time. I kept talking, didn't even pay attention. All right, KGV, KGV, uh, K, I think that's King James Version. It says, I'm considering forgetting, uh, forgetting to raise quail for eggs and meat. I have a local quail farm who has pharaoh quails. What are the pros and cons of pharaohs versus caternic? They're the same thing. Pharaohs, uh, uh, caternic's quail. Um, it's just a certain type, that's it. They're, they're caternics though, it's the same thing. Um, all right, guys, I got a lot of comments. I'm sorry if I did not get to your comment. I got to wrap this up. I got to go spend a little bit of time with my wife before it's time for me to go to bed, get up, and do it all over again one more day. So hopefully you guys all have a great 4th of July. If you're from America, I guess, that's not a holiday anywhere else. If you're not from America, have a great weekend, and uh, hopefully we'll see you guys back here again next weekend. Take care. Thank you guys for joining tonight. I appreciate it, and God bless. Bye.